Ephesians 6, please. Ephesians 6. Let me just say a couple things here while we're finding our place. I'm honored to be here. This, uh, I was saved in 1969. They say if you can remember the 60s, you weren't really there. But I needed to get saved. And as an 18-year-old young man, I heard the gospel and trusted Christ. And our church had just a handful of people and one set of teeth. And it was really a uh, challenge in our church. Uh, we tried to win souls and tried to grow, but boy, we languished 30 people, 40 people, 50 people. And it can be very discouraging when you're in the will of God and thinking you're doing the, the right thing and then there doesn't seem to be the fruit that you'd like to see. And the pastor that led me to Christ, Howard Nelson, said, we're going down to Hammond to, to pastor school. And they have outreaches to the streets and to the various people groups and to the deaf and the blind and a tow truck ministry and the bluebirds and and I'm saying when you come from where I come from and you come down to pastor school, it was a life-changing experience. I never, ever got over it. Uh, if you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6, you'll know the early chapters were seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and the middle chapters walk as children of light and the latter chapters stand having done all to stand in the breastplate and all. And Watchman Nee wrote a commentary on the, on the book of Ephesians, Sit, Walk, Stand, and it's a great way to look at the book. But at the end of all the deep theology that's actually in here and all of the practical applications that's in here, you s slide down to verse number 18, 19, and 20, where we'll find our text, and I'll let you stay seated but <clears throat> if you would just mark this or have your finger there, and we're going to look at here and one Old Testament passage, and that's Isaiah 28. And if you want to put a marker in Isaiah 28, that's where we'll be shortly. But uh, for, for now, our text, watch carefully, praying always, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, Paul, to the church at Ephesus, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. But particularly 19 and 20, watch, Paul to the church, and for me, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And then let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time in the Bible. And these folks, Lord, every one of them, their life is just as important to you as mine is. And what you've done in their life is just as important as what you've done in my life. It's my turn to talk, but Lord, I pray each one here would know that we respect and appreciate the sacrifice they make to be in church, God's house, assembling with God's people on a Wednesday night. Reward them for that. Help us through your word tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice there's three elements here, and it's always this way. He said, pray for me. And most of us would say, are you kidding? Pray for me? I mean, the apostle, the one that's written half our New Testament, the one that's teaching the revealing the mysteries that were revealed into the New Testament, and the apostle Paul says to them, would you pray for me? And then he says, pray that God would open a door of utterance. And we all know this is true, uh, opportunities to give the gospel. Yes, you knock doors and talk to people on the street just like me, but 
opportunities to talk to someone. It's kind of like a freight train car going past with a side door open. You know and I know, if you're soul conscious at all, if you pray, Lord, please give me an opportunity to speak for you, that those opportunities kind of come sliding by you, and that window sometimes, or that door is open for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, and that person would listen to you. That person struck up a conversation with you. That person is listening to you. And so often we're like the Arctic River frozen at the mouth, and it's, oh, I prayed for God to open a door of utterance, and, and oh, what should I say? And the Apostle Paul says, pray that utterance will be given unto me, watch, and that I may open my mouth, and he says it twice. Pray that I would open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And you would say like me, ah, are you kidding me? The apostle Paul, that lion for God, that champion for Christ, the guy who goes into a city and goes straight into the Jewish synagogue and preaches Jesus Christ, that guy who gets chased out of town or let down over a wall and he preaches Jesus Christ a night and a day in the deep, beaten with stripes, over and over, he gets up and preaches the gospel. He gets up and preaches the gospel. He gets up and preaches the gospel. And you say, if that energizer bunny needed to ask for boldness, where do I sit? Where do I come in? I mean, he, he was the boldest person we ever met. And yet, he says, pray for me that I would open my mouth boldly. You know what that tells us? It's kind of naturally human to shirk back. Oh, they wouldn't want to listen. Oh, I don't want to offend them. Hey, I don't want to intrude. Oh, and, and here Paul says, pray that as utterance is given to me that I'd open my mouth boldly. This same thing is repeated in his letter to the Colossians chapter four, but I want you to particularly note that verse 20, for he says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, and look at that last clause, as I ought to speak. This is where the rubber really meets the road. Okay, the opportunity's here. Okay, the Holy Spirit is emboldening me, okay. Uh, uh, but now, what do I say? I don't want to necessarily offend them or alienate them, but I want to be clear. And so the prayer target tonight, just two things. Lord, help me to be bold, but help me have discretion. Help me speak as I ought to speak. And so that's just where we're going, and we're going to look at an Old Testament passage. You know... Many times when the Lord Jesus would speak or the Apostle Paul would speak, they'd choose an Old Testament verse or two, and then they would apply it to New Testament Christianity. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Was that written for the ox's sake or for our sake? No doubt it was written for our sakes. Now let me direct you back to Isaiah 28, and that's where we'll spend the next hour and a half. Ha! You think I'm kidding. But look, um, it would help you to know this. I was born and raised on a farm. I still live on our family farm. It's been in our family since 1847. And I milked cows my whole life. My dad lost his right hand in a corn picker. And from the time I was eight years old, Every morning at four o'clock, we got up and went out and milked cows. And my dad didn't sit at the end of the row saying, oh, you're my little champion, Randy. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're my hero. Uh, we, it, it wasn't like that on our farm. We did what we were expected to do, plus nothing. And the reward we got was to eat. We got to eat. And... Um, so I, I don't understand the entitlement of a lot of this generation, but one of the things we learned on the farm 
was taking care of the crops and animal husbandry and putting new rings in an Alice Chalmers tractor and we learned to take care of our buildings and everything electrical or plumbing, we just did it. You couldn't afford to hire people, you just fix it. But there's so many wonderful things that we learned and I was 18 when I got saved. And the, the beauty, when you take somebody who's never read the Bible, I wasn't stupid, I had a full ride scholarship to study mechanical engineering, but totally ignorant of the Bible. And when I started reading it, God puts man in a garden. And God says, as an eagle, so the Lord. And God talks about creation and agriculture. It was such a joy to me to feast in the Bible on the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits or the Sower went forth to sow, and some on good, and some on some the birds took. And, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you under my wings as a hen doth gather her chicks? And I've seen it, you know, where there's a hawk up there, and it goes ee, and Mom's got those little chicks, and she cluck cluck cluck, and she puts her wings out like that, and those little yellow fuzzballs come in, and so the hawk doesn't have a Snickers candy bar. When you when you see it. Why does God use all these agrarian illustrations? Because the people were close to the earth. And all of education is like that. Uh, I, I, I don't have a skinny kid up here, but sometimes I'll have a skinny teenager come up and I'll say, he does, has never tasted a donut, and obviously I have. <laughs> and when he says... Brother King, what does a donut taste like? How do I get him from the unknown into the known? I try to relate to him with what he does know. Have you ever tasted a brownie? Well, yes, okay. Some donuts are like that, where they're dense and textured, but with frosting on. Have you ever tasted apple pie? Well, yes, well, some donuts are like that, where they have a crust and a filling. Have you ever had angel food cake? What am I doing? I'm trying to find what he does know and lead him into what he doesn't know. And that's why when the Bible uses all these farm illustrations, they got that. As an eagle, so the Lord flutters over. And there are so many things like that in the Bible. And so as a farm kid reading the Bible for the first time, it was like, are you kidding me? I didn't learn this from the Bible. I learned it from life experience. And it makes all kinds of sense. My concept of God and what he was doing. And so Isaiah 28 is the passage we're going to look at. But I want to make a couple observations. We're going to talk tonight about sowing the seed. And here's what farmers know. They know that it takes work and preparation before you plant the seed. It takes time. Here's what else they know. They know that they're entirely dependent upon God's sun to shine, God's wind to blow, and God's rain to fall, or there's not going to be a crop. And they also know that you have all kinds of things you can do select the right seed, plant in the right month, all kinds of things. But one thing you cannot do is put life into the seed. All the efforts cannot grow a crop. That life in that seed is a divine thing. And if people are going to be saved at all, you can sow the gospel and you can preach to people, pray for people, witness to people, but only the Holy Spirit of God can enlighten, convict, draw, and save. You can't do God's part in this work. The farmer gets that. I don't put the life in the seed. I do my part, but God does his part. It's a divine thing. So what's happening in Isaiah 28? We're going to take it out of context, but I want you to know I understand the concept and the context here 
God's working on Israel. He had told them, if you be willing and obedient, you eat the fat of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, I'm going to chasten you. And you're going to go off into bondage. And here they are, the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, the ten tribes, the two tribes. They go off. And God raises up prophets to go. And here's the message. You're getting spanked and you had it coming. That's tough apples. But all through Isaiah, it's, hey, prophesy against these and prophesy against these. But sprinkled throughout Isaiah are these wonderful promises. God's not done with Israel. You're still precious in his sight. He's working on you. And by the time you get to Isaiah 53, all the promises of a coming Messiah and some wonderful things, and this interplay through all of Isaiah, you find here in Isaiah 28, and he basically uses a farm illustration. He says, you know how a farmer works on his field to get a desired crop? Well, Israel, God's working on you to get a desired result. That's what's actually happening in Isaiah 28. But read with me the last part of this chapter, verse 23. But watch, watch this carefully, and we'll just traipse through these. Give ye ear, and hear my voice, hearken, and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches, and scatter the common, and cast in the principal wheat, and the appointed barley, and the rye in their place? For his God, look at here, 26, for his God doth instruct him to discretion, and doth teach him. Verse 27, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the common, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff, and the coming with a rod. Bread corn is bruised, because you'll not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. 29. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. So just follow me for a few minutes, and I promise I'm trying to help you here in this aspect. Lord, give me boldness but help me speak as I ought to speak. And the illustration we're going to use here is, how does a farmer maximize the chance that the seed he plants is going to grow? How does he maximize the chance? So here it says, doth the plowman, verse 24, plow all day to sow. Notice it's kind of like you've got the end in view. You have a long-term goal. You have an uh, uh, ulterior motive. When I go out in the spring to plow our ground, I don't get on the tractor and just go out there because I love to hear the roar of the John Deere engine or I love to buy diesel fuel. I go out there because I want to stay married. I plow so I can grow a crop so I can feed it to my cows, so they give more milk, so I can sell it to the dairy. And then they send me a check, and I cash it at the bank, and I buy my wife a dress, and stay married! <laughs> I get it. When I went out there, I had that in mind. It's cheaper than alimony. It's a basic financial decision. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? It's a rhetorical question. It's patently obvious. Yes, yes, he plows all day because he in, has in mind he's going to sow. But does he go out? When you have that moldboard plow and you got hunks of earth the size of caskets, does he go out and just start sowing seed? Hey, look at that. I plowed it. No, no. Look what it says. Doth he not... Uh, doth he open and break the clods of his ground? You take the harrow, you take the disc, you take the drag, you go over it. Even if you're not a farmer, you know this is true. If you're a gardener, 
You rototill your garden and you got hunks of clay the size of softballs. Do you plant them? No, you don't. No, you don't. Why? Because it would be a waste of seed to just think that you're going to get the best crop doing that. You break up the clods. He opens and breaks the clods of his ground. Now, hear me carefully. We're going to talk about just giving out tracts. But I'm talking about when you know somebody, when you cultivate a relationship, when you're trying to win a loved one, a relative, a neighbor, a coworker, a deer hunting buddy, there, it takes time. You don't, you don't just say when you're wash, doing your laundry, hey, I don't have time for all this wash, wash, wash stuff. I'm going to just put it on rinse, spin here. You know better than that. It doesn't work that way. And here he says, look, a farmer, when he goes out and plows, he breaks the clods of his ground in verse 25. When, when, when he hath made plain the face thereof. In other words, when the soil is broken up. Why? Why do we want good tilth in the soil? Why do we want it to break up? Why do we want it to be soft and crumbly? Because we know to give it best chance for seed to germinate and grow, it's got to have good seed to soil contact. And if I'm going to plant my seeds, I want that soil real close to it. And if I don't, if I'm not smart enough, if I just plant it without making it well prepared, I only get half a crop. It just takes the the time and the effort. You might have to wait for God to rain on it one more time. Hey, sometimes people that you're burdened for, their heart isn't quite ready to receive it. And you just got to have, notice it says in verse 26, the Lord gives the farmer discretion on how to plant to maximize his crop. Look what it goes on to say. When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not, and watch the phrases, cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin. Some seed, if you're planting, cumin and fitches are grass seeds. If you're planting grass seeds in order to give them the best chance to grow, you scatter them on top. You cast abroad. You just... And you might tickle a little dirt on them, or you might cover it with straw. Why? Because you know with those seeds, if you planted them six inches deep, they would rot and never grow. You can't do that. You can't do that. You cast abroad and you scatter. Look, um, you're at the county fair. You're prayed up. We got a booth. We spent 200 bucks. We got tables we got tracks. We're ready. Lord, help us win souls. And you're there, and I've done it time after time. But here comes a junior high girl by, and she's walking past your table. A great big teddy bear in her right arm and a teenage orangutan in her left arm. You don't honestly believe, except in very, very rare cases, that she wants you to follow her around and start reading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Listen to me. You don't have to be a social misfit. You can be halfway civil. Just, hey, sweetheart, look, give them a chance. Give them a chance to go to heaven. They can't be saved without the gospel. You've got to get them the gospel but you can scatter it on the top. You can just say, hey, excuse me, sweetheart, listen, I would like you and your friend here to, to have a good day at the fair, but boy, here's a, a gospel track that tells you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. If I can answer any question, I'd be glad to, but just promise me you'll read it before you go to bed tonight. Leave a halfway decent taste in their mouth that you're civil, that you understand that. Hey, there might be occasionally somebody comes by and there's been a sacred ant praying for them. There's been someone talking to them. They've been thinking about it and they respond. And it's so wonderful when they do that. 
But don't alienate. Don't make it harder for the next person. Just scatter it on the top. Well, Brother King, do you think they can get saved just from, just from a tract? Yes, I believe they can get saved just from John 3.16. When the ship wrecked in Acts 27, they all escaped safe to land, but some were just on pieces of the ship. You can get there on one board if God's in it. And so you scatter it abroad. I travel full time the last nine years, and every place I go, before I leave my motel room, I say, Lord, open a door of utterance. When I get in my car and I drive for a couple hours, but every McDonald's all around this country at 7.30 in the morning has the exact same thing. Romeos, retired old men eating out. (laughs) They're in there. I pull into the Golden Arches, I use the coffee return station, I go and get another cup of coffee and a sausage muffin, and I could do like you. Well, I'm a stranger here. I don't know any of these people. Uh, And I'm going to my little tray, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to sit by myself in this little table, and I'm going to stare at that bunch of old guys. But I don't do that. I like being with me, they would like being with me. (laughs) I put my tray on their table. I swashbuckle in between them, pull up a chair and say, sorry I'm late, fellas. (laughs) These guys have been in there every day for the last seven years. They have told every story they know They have lied to each other, said things that never happened. (laughs) But I just start eating my muffin. Look, there's one person at the table they don't know. It's me. (laughs) Pretty soon one of them broaches the subject. Hey, uh, who are you? Randy King. Oh, where are you coming from? Well, Wisconsin, a farm in Wisconsin. Really, where are you headed? Well, this time, West Virginia. Wow, what are you going to do in West Virginia? Well, I'm preaching there. I'm a Baptist preacher. Hey, you guys, watch your language. There's a preacher at the table. (laughs) Right? We talk. We kibitz a little bit. I'm going to get on down the road. But it's not coinky dinky that I have a track full of pocket. A pocket full of tracks. It's not by accident. I intended to talk to somebody. Right? Open a door of utterance. Give me boldness. It's not uncommon when I pass out tracts to have one or more of the men say, well, I am a Christian. Thank you for stopping. I have never had a man turn down a gospel tract after a 20-minute, 30-minute, just spit and whittle at the at the table. I'm just saying, you know, this, oh, nobody cares, nobody listens. You'd be surprised who would listen if you honestly, just sincerely, kindly talk to people. Hey, they suddenly scattered on the top. Notice it says, and they cast abroad the fitches, but they cast in the principal wheat and barley and the rye in its place. There are times that you get to sow it a lot deeper, and you get to be in a lot deeper conversation. Thursday night, when we're planning a Saturday funeral, and all the family is sitting around, now they are thinking about mortality. Now they are thinking about eternity. Now they are wondering where their loved one is. And now... I get to talk seriously to family member after family. Hey, here's what I'm going to preach. You guys are eulogizing, and I'm going to do my very best to comfort. But boy, why would you want a pastor at this funeral anyway? You want me to give hope beyond the grave. I don't know where this person went for sure, If their profession is that they have trusted Christ, they're in heaven. 
But whether or not they went to heaven, here's what you know for sure. If they're in heaven, they want you there. And if they're in hell, they don't want you there. And if you want to honor the memory of your sacred loved one, then you'll trust Christ. I've led dozens and dozens of people to Christ when, when you get a chance to sow it deeper. And I'm only saying, how does a farmer know? I plant my beets this deep and my carrots this deep and my peas this deep and my beans this deep and my corn this deep and my potatoes four inches and my asparagus roots six inches. How does he know? Verse 26 says, for the Lord instructs him. You can't take an asparagus root and sow it like you do a grass seed. You put an asparagus root on the top like you did a grass seed and it withers and dies. God can give you wisdom on how to sow to maximize the chance that they would listen. Again, they don't get saved by your personality. They don't get saved by your winsome talk. They don't get saved because you're the most aggressive debater. They don't get saved because you're passionate and you have blood dripping out of your eyes. They only get saved when the Holy Spirit of God does the work. You can't put life in the seed. But does it matter how you talk to people? I mean, people say to me, Brother King, are you for lifestyle evangelism or confrontational soul winning? And I go, I didn't even know they were fighting. I, I'm from a small town. If you expect, there's not much to see, but what you hear makes up for it. Everybody knows whose husband's good and whose checkbook isn't. If you expect to have the credibility to talk to anybody, you dead sure better be living it. They know who's a genuine Christian and who's not. I, they won't be saved just by watching me drive to church. They're only saved by the message of the gospel, and I'm supposed to be an ambassador. It's just all there is to it. And so somebody's got to talk to him. Notice verse 27. For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the common. There's those grass seeds again. Have you ever seen grass seeds when they're full in the head and their head is turning brown and, and you can just touch it, kick it with your foot? And I use the illustration of a, a dandelion when it goes from yellow to gray and it's got all them little fuzzies on it. How hard is it to get the seed off? Boom. Nothing, right? Nothing. It's just a rod, a staff. You just tap it. and it. Look, there are low-hanging fruit. There are those little girls coming up out of Sunday school. And we know just planting isn't all there is to farming. You plant, but you still have to harvest. And so he says, God gives them discretion on how to plant, and then God gives them discretion on how to reap. And... Here it says, the cumin and the fitches are just with a staff. A six-year-old girl comes out of Sunday school, and, and she tugs on her teacher's skirt, and she says, I want to be saved. Uh, I, I don't want to go to hell. I want Jesus to save me. You don't have to start with, you know, your grandmother wore army boots. You don't have to elaborate on the depths of sin she steeped into. You can take the Bible and you can kneel down beside her and you say, hey, sweetheart, God loves you and Jesus paid for your sins. And if you'll just ask him to save you, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not easy, easy believe. What's hard believism? It's just, it's in Christ by faith. And even a child can take a drink of water, right? I mean, it's just, is that simple? The people that try to make it more complicated than that, I believe they're adding works most of the time to salvation. It's by faith in Christ alone. But I had an occasion. I was in my office, 927, desperately trying to find a sermon. Lord, it's a thick book. Surely there's something in here for the people. And a knock on the door. It's our head usher. Pastor, this is Carol. 
And Carol walks in with a gospel tract with my picture on it. And she says, are you Pastor King? Well, <laughs> do I owe you money? <laughs> and um, I said, yes. She said, well, I've been thinking a lot about death and eternity, and I'm concerned that I'm not going to go to heaven. And I was in Walmart, and I was trying to buy a Bible. And I found this Bible, and she held it up, and it was like your songbook, a hardcover King James Bible. And I just turned around to the man that was standing there, and I said, is this a good Bible? And he opened it up and said, yeah, that's a good Bible. And she said to him, hey, I, I'm, I want to go to heaven. And he gave me this little pamphlet, and he said, listen, you go see Pastor King. He's an expert on how to go to heaven. And a woman walks in my office and holds a tract and says, are you an expert on how to go to heaven? I told her, get out of here. I'm trying to get a sermon. <laughs> no, no. My wife was right there in the, in the annex and and I said, Lori, would you take Carol and lead her to Christ? That lady got saved as sure as anybody's breathing free air, and she's been a member of our church for 35 years. Now, I, I never met her before that second. There are things that just happen easily. But notice verse 28. Bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it nor break it with the wheel of his cart nor bruise it with his uh, And I know this is talking about wheat, but you think of a 40 acre field of, of ear corn, field corn, that same staff, that same rod that you used on the fitches when that ear is ripe in it's second week of October. And do you go out in that field and take that same stick and go tap, tap, tap? How long do you think you'd be harvesting a 40-acre field? It don't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You can't just treat every situation the same. You're at work, and there's a de Bible-denying, God-hating, Christ-rejecting sinner. He's a blasphemous man. He cusses and cusses. If he didn't cuss, he'd be a mute. What? Do you do that? Do you go and say, hey, sweetheart, Jesus loves you. You did that with a six-year-old girl. No, no, no. You might say, Henry, I don't want to be within a thousand miles of you when the fire falls because you're going to fry like a pork. It might be the only language he understands. Notice something here. It says, bread corn is bruised. Do you believe that God has a hammer big enough for that guy? It might be the cartwheel of you have terminal cancer. It might be the cartwheel of your fired for stealing from work. It might be the cartwheel of divorce papers. It might be the cartwheel of a lesbian daughter. I don't know, but God has hammers big enough for any sinner on this planet. And when, when they're ready to talk to somebody, who do they know that's been a consistent, sincere Christian, who's ever expressed any concern for their soul? You, you may not realize this, but many people who laugh at you and mock you and reject you secretly hope in their heart of hearts that what you have is real because they know what they have is not. 
It's hard for some people to fathom, but you're the best Christian somebody knows. When that happens, when God gets their attention, when they're ready to talk to somebody, when the soil's prepared and when the crop is ripe, hey, hey, God's working. There's usually a fragile time between devastation and death when they'll talk to somebody. Don't you want to be that person? Don't you want to be? The, I'm just saying to you, bread corn is bruised because you'll not ever be threshing it. Don't plague them. You can say, hey, Bob, I'm still praying for you. You can express your love, express your care. Ask, when could I sit down seriously? Could I come to your home? No, 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 no. But never lose sight that God will give you a chance, even in the hardest cases. It's so uh, important. I'm, I'm done. Notice what it says here. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts. How to sow and how to reap. God gives the farmer wisdom. I know he's talking to Israel. But when Paul prayed, Lord, give me boldness. Open the door of utterance. Give me boldness to speak, but help me speak as I ought to speak. Could you pray a prayer like that between you and God and, and mean it with all your heart? That same Carol said to me, Brother King, you know I'm driving almost 70 miles to come to church every service. And it would be the same distance for you to come to my house. And I'm married. And my husband's not saved. And I've been praying for him the last few months when I've been coming to church. And I sure want to see my husband saved. And I think you'd be the perfect person to talk to him. And I said, well, tell me about him. Well, he was married before. And he had three little girls. And his wife caught him molesting his stair step daughters. Every one of them had been molested repeatedly. And she divorced him and reported him to the police. And he went to prison for 20 years. And and he is the most angry, bitter person I know. But I always liked stray dogs and cats, and I started visiting the prison, and boy, I felt sorry for him because nobody really cared about him, but I just started seeing him every week, and eventually I fell in love with him and married him. Now here's the miracle when a pastor can hear something like that, and keep a straight face. That's only the grace of God. I said, you what? Oh, I married him. And he's out now. And he can't get along with anybody. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. So he bought a semi and we live out in the country. And he is doing his best to avoid talking to any human at any time. And thank God for you conniving women. She says, on Tuesday, I know he's going to be home. He doesn't have to leave until midnight. And I'm going to fix his favorite meal. And I'll have him in a good mood. You come over around 7. Hey, a little bit of a setup. I drive out there, I find the place. He's outside, and he's got a semi-load of 100-pound bags of potatoes filled to the gills, but the bearings are out on the rear axle of that trailer. And he's got a second trailer van backed up to it, six feet apart, with the door open, and this one's empty, but it's got good bearings. This one is full. It is August. 
90 degrees out, muggy, mosquitoes, some of them two years old. I saw mosquitoes with ticks on them. Okay, I lied about that. Listen, listen. Can I tell you what a good mood he was in? It's seven o'clock, but these potatoes have to go in this truck. Hey, I shucked off my coat, took off my dress shirt, tie, for mercy's sake, left my t-shirt on. I'm not fat, but I'm definitely famine resistant. I jumped up on the plank and started carrying potatoes all the way up to the front of this one. I'd meet him halfway and he'd swear. I just ignored it, picked potatoes, carried it to the front. He'd meet me coming back and he'd swear. I came, this went on, I heard words that I hadn't heard in a long, long, long time. came to talk to you. Can I tell you, after a little while, the Popeye, that was one of my heroes. I've had all I can stands, I can't stands no more. Out came the spinach. Finally, I had a bag of potatoes. He was coming back. He called me a few things that... And I ran right into him with the bag of potatoes and I said, shut your mouth. I used to speak French. I know those words. But if you think I'm some kind of shriveling violet that's just going to run away because you cuss, you got another thing coming. I drove here to talk to you and before I leave, I'm going to talk to you. But until then, shut your mouth and carry potatoes. <laughs> we carried potatoes in silence until this van was full. We pulled the door down. It's 1030 at night. We're both soaked to the gills, sopping wet. We stunk. We could knock a pole cat off a garbage can stunk. And I said, hey, I came to talk to you. At least give me a glass of water or lemonade in 15 minutes. I know you got to drive to Lima, Ohio tonight. Now hear me. What's he going to say? He's seen a lot of stuff go on in the name of Christianity, but it's pretty tough to refute. Doth the plowman plow? all day to sow. You do what it takes. You pay the price it takes. I sat down at the table, his wife, weeping, just crestfallen, brings out two glasses of lemonade, goes in the be bedroom with the door cracked open. I took the Bible and led that man to faith in Jesus Christ. He called on the Lord and asked for forgiveness. If I didn't believe God could save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him, I'd get out of the preaching business. A lot of people have very regrettable past. Those that need much forgiven, they love much. I'm glad God was merciful to me. Well, that lady was in there and she'd been listening and she came out shouting and laughing and having a Baptocostal fit and she hugged her husband and she hugged him and twisted him around. I didn't get into it for that, but listen to me. Two weeks later, he fell asleep at the wheel ran off the road and was killed in a tragic accident. No, he never got baptized. No, he never uh, spent one day darkening the doors of our church. Never. I didn't get in it just to build a church. I'm after souls. 
And, I, and I'm challenging you tonight. Every one of us, if we're honest, we'd say, Lord, I need more boldness. Boy, I need boldness. And when those opportunities come, when there's a door of utterance, Lord, I want to speak in a way that would give it the best chance that they'd listen. Help me. Help me speak as I ought to speak. They won't get saved without the gospel. You've got to give them the gospel. Paul, you know, said, I'm, I'm an ambassador for the gospel. But tonight, I'm going to ask you this question. Who do you know? Maybe one of your children, maybe one of your parents, maybe a coworker, maybe a fishing friend. Maybe it's a guy that you see every week at the grocery store or a girl at a gas station or someone, and you've been seeking a way to speak to him. You maybe have given him a gospel track in the past. You may have been stiff-armed away in the past. But there's somebody that God has on your heart, and you say, Lord, please, my sacred aunt, my beloved grandson, Lord, would you help me say precisely what would best help them to listen? Could you pray a prayer like that between you and God Almighty? Lord, please help me be bold, but when I speak, could I speak as I ought to speak to that precious one that you loved and died for?